Kristen Atchison here, and we're going to finish up chapter 10 um, with the rest of making causal claims and the kinds of validity that we need to really be able to make determinations about cause and effect. So some of this will be review, um, some of this will be new, um, but it's all for the greater good of understanding experimental research. So, again, there are four basic uh, Elements of an experiment, manipulation. That manipulation is typically happening where, right? It's happening in an independent variable um, because that's the variable that we're manipulating. That's our cause that we're manipulating to see if it has an effect on our dependent variable. Our effect is where we have measurement, okay? So measurement comes in and that effect, that dependent variable, um, and that's where we're gonna look to again see if our manipulation caused change on our dependent variable and we'll measure that. Then what we need to do is we need to compare, right? So we need to have, that's why we have a treatment and a control group, is so we can compare the differences between those, okay? Because if we just have one group and we do our manipulation and we test um, and we don't have anything to compare it to and we get a result of 20, okay, well, is 20 good? Is 20 bad? I don't know because I don't have anything to compare it to. So we need to have that piece of comparison as well. And the final piece of it is control. Um, and we've talked about that a little bit already and we'll continue to talk about it. Um, but again, you know, I kind of joke that uh, experimenters are kind of like control freaks um, because we really have to worry about all these really details um, so that we really can have um, the validity, the especially the internal validity, to say that our manipulation caused change on our dependent variable that we measured. So again, those causal inferences, um, we need to be free of confounds, okay? So when the independent variable is allowed to co-vary with something else, that something else can become an independent variable in and of itself, okay? So if we don't properly control for confounds, they allow for alternative explanations, okay? And when we have that alternative explanation as to what caused that change in the dependent variable, what caused that change in our measurement, we have problems with, an inter with internal validity. So an experiment that is free of confounds has internal validity because if it's free of confounds, it doesn't have any of those alternative explanations. The only thing that can be causing change on our dependent variable is our manipulation of the independent variable. And again, we kind of talked about several different ways that we can do this already. We'll continue to talk about them. Um, again, there's two main ways that we control these confounds or these alternative explanations. The first is holding everything constant, okay? We just won't let it vary at all. We won't let it become an independent variable because we won't let it vary. We'll just hold it constant. And we can do that um, in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different situations, we can hold things constant. And that's the ideal. If you can hold it constant, you should hold it constant. If it's not something that you can hold constant, if it's something that has to vary, then what you need to do is you need to either balance it or match it um, so that, again, that we spread that out between both conditions so that it's not an issue. Okay, so if it's some subject characteristic, um, we need to make, we can either use random assignment to balance that between the two groups, or we can use matching to balance that between the two groups. Either way, we're spreading that out between our control and our treatment group um, so that any differences that it may be causing will cancel each other out. So those four validities, again, that we're back to, um, that again, that you started on 3510 and that we're continuing with here in 3530, is construct validity, right? So how well were the measure, were, did we measure um, and manipulate the variables, okay? So did we manipulate what we sought to manipulate? Did we measure what we sought to measure? Um, were, do we have validity in terms of that construct, in terms of that idea that we were manipulating or measuring? Remember, construct's just another way to kind of talk about if it's a psychological construct you can kind of think about it as an idea or a thing um, that we're interested in okay it's a topic or an idea um, so if we're manipulating um, you know um, altruism we're trying to manipulate altruism um, how how did we actually manipulate altruism is where construct validity comes in if we're trying to measure um, then pro-social behavior um, did we actually measure pro-social behavior. What do we mean by pro-social behavior? What are we calling pro-social pro behavior? Um, so again, we need to make sure those constructs we're actually me measuring and manipulating what we're interested in. External validity. Who 
can we externalize, can we take these findings and apply them to, okay? So remember, external validity, validity is still true, whether it's true, and external validity is it true outside the experiment, okay? External validity. Um, so to who or what can we generalize this cause and effect claim, right? There's no point in doing a study if you can't apply it to anybody but the sample that you have. Um, so again, we want to be able to have external validity. And I talked a little bit about how those are kind of a give and take between external and internal validity, um, how they kind of go back and forth um, as our external validity increases, our internal validity typically decreases and, and vice versa. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act with those. Statistical validity, we'll spend a lot more time talking about clearly um, in the second portion of the class, but how well does the data support your conclusion, okay? So how well um, do you support this research hypothesis? Did you find support for the research hypothesis? Were you able to reject the null or did you fail to reject the null? Um, so how likely is it that you would get this kind of finding um, with um, if the null hypothesis was true or if the null hypothesis um, can be rejected. And internal validity, and again, we have a whole chapter de uh, dedicated to this as well, um, but are there alternative explanations for the outcome? Is there a confound? Is there something else going on besides our manipulation of the independent variable that caused the change on the dependent and variable? And for experiments, internal validity is really the one that we're most concerned with. Because experimentation is looking at cause and effect, the only way we can really make these cause and effect judgments is if we have really, really strong internal validity, if we don't have alternative explanations. Um, these others are important pieces too, um, but if we, ha if we don't have internal validity, it doesn't really matter about statistical validity and construct validity and external validity as well because there could be these alternative explanations. And so we, don't we can't even say necessarily that A is causing B um, and look at the statistical validity or look at the external validity because if there's an alternative explanation that could be C that's causing B, then it doesn't really matter. So again, internal validity is kind of the most important one that we're concerned about in experimentation. So in construct validity, how well did we measure and manipulate? Um, for dependent variables, did we measure them well? For independent variables, did we manipulate them well or did we operationalize them well? Um, we do that with a manipulation check, okay? And a manipulation check is, did your manipulation work? And it can be done in a number of different ways. But say we were trying to manipulate altruism, okay? We were trying to make people be more altruistic. So we have a group of people, and the way we're going to do this, um, we've seen in the literature that when people see people, other people behaving al with altruism, that they are more likely to behave with altruism themselves. So we have half of our group uh, is randomly assigned to the condition where they see an altruistic act, and the other half of the group is randomly assigned to a condition where they don't see an altruistic act. Um, it's going to be really important to see what we're trying to measure here, manipulate, is altruism. And how we're doing that is them watching this altruistic act. But we have to make sure that they actually saw the altruistic act. Did our manipulation actually manipulate anything? And that's where this manipulation check comes in. So say we were doing kind of a naturalistic experiment. So this is happening, you know, maybe on campus somewhere. And we're hoping that people are going to see this altruistic act and behave um, in altruistic ways because they have seen this act. Um, but did they actually see it? Did they actually see that manipulation? Did they actually see that happen? And so maybe what we do um, is after the study, we ask them, did you see this event? Um, after we've done the entire study, after we've done our manipulation and we've done our measurement and the study's over, kind of in our debriefing section, we can put that manipulation check in. Did, this ha did you see this? Because if you didn't see it, then our manipulation didn't work. Um, but did you see it? Did you see this altruistic act? Did did that change your behavior? Um, what did you think about that altruistic app? That would be an example of a manipulation check. So it's again something that's allowing us to check and see if we manipulated what we thought we manipulated. Another way we can do this is a pilot study. A pilot study is kind of like a mini study that you do at the beginning before you do um, your main study. And a lot of times um, you'll do that to see is this going to work? Okay, this is what I think will work if I do it this way, um, but will it work? And so a pilot study allows you to kind of um, really quickly with just a couple of people kind of do those manipulations and see if they're actually working, if that manipulation's actually um, changing um, the dependent variable. So again, you can kind of check and see ahead of time um, if it's working 
and then you go back in and you do the full study later, which tends to be more controlled. But it's really just a way to check and see, is this going to work the way I think it's going to work before you get, you know, 120 subjects in. Um, so a pilot study is usually a smaller group of people that you're able to check and see, um, was I manipulating what I thought I was manipulating? It's another way to kind of look um, at this construct validity. So again, these manipulation checks are these additional measures that assess how the per participants perceived or interpreted, whether your manipulation actually took, right? Um, or you assess the direct effect of the manipulation, okay? So there's, we need to really kind of look and see, did this manipulation actually happen? And did that manipulation have an effect? And there's two ways we can do that. We can really take explicit measures, so say if we're doing a study on mood, okay, um, and we're trying to manipulate somebody's mood, okay, um, we need to make sure that it's actually been altered. So we have um, different groups of people assigned to listen to different, um, randomly assigned, because this is an experiment, to listen to three different kinds of music. One music really um, is supposed to be kind of keep you in a neutral mood. One set of music is really supposed to induce um, happiness. And one set of music is really supposed to kind of depress um, or um, increase sadness. And so what's going to be important, and then we're going to measure performance, okay? How does this mood affect performance on, let's say, a memory test? We need to make sure that mood was actually manipulated, right? Did we actually make the happy people happy? Did we actually make the people in the sad condition sad? And did the neutral people stay right there in the middle? And so we can, again, ask those specific questions about the manipulation. Like I talked about before in the altruism experiment, that would be what's called an exit interview, okay? We ask after the study is over, um, you know, how did that music make you feel, okay? Um, and we can ask that. And there, we can ask those questions earlier on, too, in some, in some cases, um, but it can also be done as an exit interview. Manipulation checks are really important um, in several different ways. Um, situations, one of which is participant manipulations. We're trying to manipulate the participant. So that mood example is a participant manipulation. We're trying to manipulate something about the participant, okay? Their mood, we're trying to manipulate that. Um, so we need to make sure we actually did that. The altruism is also um, a participant manipulation. Other situations that's important would be really subtle manipulations. Um, so again, if you were doing a naturalistic experiment, say you were looking at door opening, um, seeing other people open the door, whether that makes you more likely to open the door. Um, and so you, we have a confederate out there opening a door for students um, and seeing if other students then hold the door for other people. Um, but you have to make sure that people saw that little tiny manipulation of the confederate opening the door, okay? So those subtle manipulations are important. In any kind of simulation, um, we really need to make sure um, that that's happening as well. And finally, in a placebo control. So a placebo, remember, um, is when somebody thinks they're getting the treatment, but they're not really. Um, the most generic form of that is kind of the sugar pill in a medicine study. A placebo control can be done behaviorally as well. Again, when somebody thinks they're getting the treatment, but they're not necessarily getting the treatment. And so we have to make sure that the person who's in this placebo control actually thinks that they're getting the treatment and not getting a placebo. Because the whole idea with this placebo effect is the idea of getting the treatment somehow changes you, changes your behavior. Um, so if you think you're getting the medication, you'll feel better. Um, some good examples of this are... Um, you know, with a small child, you give them a Band-Aid and automatically they feel better, okay? They can be screaming and crying and the world is ending. Um, you give them a Band-Aid and it feels better. The Band-Aid didn't make it feel better, but they thought the Band-Aid was going to make it feel better, so they did. Um, the same thing with like, when you take a headache medicine, you take an Advil or a Tylenol. Um, you take it and almost immediately you start to feel better um, because you think that it's going to work. And so you, it really starts to work faster than it actually did because of that perception, because of that kind of placebo control. So again, we got to make sure that people actually think that they're getting a treatment for this placebo really to work. External validity, um, again, this is about generalizing to other people. Who can we generalize to? Um, we also want to be able to generalize to other situations as well. Um, so we want to not only generalize to other people outside of our sample, we want to generalize to other situations outside of our experiment. And if our external validity is poor, 
what happens, right? Well, and again, one study by itself has pretty low external validity, okay? For a study, um, some studies can have higher alternative validity, but one study by itself doesn't have much to stand on. That's why we don't say one study proves anything, because it doesn't. It's one study by itself. To really have this external validity, to really say that these things are happening to everybody and this is what that phenomenon looks like, we have to have a whole bunch of studies piled up on top of each other. And we have to have them done with different people. We have to have them done with different ways. So we really are looking at this from all different angles to really be able to say, no, no, this is what's happening in this phenomenon. A is causing B. And I can say this because of this body of literature that supports this. Not just one study, a body of literature. So again, one study by itself really has pretty low external validity, um, especially one experiment by itself. Um, but as we pile these on top of each other, we get more and more external validity. Um, so remember that external validity is the extent to which we can generalize those findings to other people, settings, conditions, anything outside of what we did in this one experiment. And again, any study by itself really has very limited external validity. We really need to pile these things on top of each other with replication um, so that we get this really strong external validity. And so that's why if you write in your paper that this proves that, I'll say cross it out, say it doesn't prove it, I'll cross it out every single time um, because one study doesn't prove it. Okay, it can support that, it can suggest that, but it can't prove that because one study by itself, again, has this very limited external validity. We really, really need to have a body of literature to really be able to say these things. And even then, they're still theories, okay? It's not necessarily um, kind of written in stone. These are adapting, changing ideas about how we understand behavior in the mind. Um, so some questions about external validity. Um, would the same findings occur in different settings? If you have good external validity, if you have really high external validity, yes. Um, in different conditions, the answer should also be yes, if you have good external validity. And with different participants, again, the answer should be yes, if you have really good external validity. An example would be um, that research with college students is really often criticized because of low external validity. OK, um, when we do my my Psych 101 students um, have to participate in at least six hours of research um, as part of their grade for the course. OK, and Psych 101 students, just like you guys, you've all been Psych 101 students or 1101 students, I'm sorry, um, are, are different than adults as a whole. OK, A, you have to be at least mildly interested in, you know, the mind and behavior to be in a psych class or at least need a requirement. Psych 1101 students are going to be more educated than the general population of people in the world, the general adult, um, and more educated than most even 18 year olds at that age across the world, okay? Um, they've, they're a different um, group of people. There's a different characteristics. Generally, they're going to be higher income than most other people across the world, most other adults across the world. Um, so there's these things about uh, these 1101 students and college students in general that really aren't representative of the population of adults that you're studying. When you're studying adults um, and you're using 18 to 25 year olds as your kind of your demographic, is that representative of adults when you mean adults in terms of the population of 18 to death, okay? Is that? That's the question, right? So they have this low, they're criticized for this low internal validity. However, just like with a pilot study, we're kind of just trying to test out our manipulation to see if it works. These samples are often really important in testing out a theory, okay? Because if the theory doesn't work with the college students, it's not going to probably work with the general population either, okay? So this allows like a testing ground. And again, one study by itself um, doesn't really matter. External validity. Again, when we're increasing this, we can include other situations, settings, populations, and 
other things in which we want to generalize to, okay? So we, again, in subsequent replications, we're gonna add pieces of the puzzle back. Okay, well, we found it in this setting. Let's try it in this setting. Do we find the same thing? We found it in this population of college students. Let's try it with this population um, from the general population. Let's try it from a sample from the general population. Let's try it with a sample um, of older adults. Let's try it with a sample of middle-aged adults. Let's try it, um, in different situations. And again, start adding back pieces of this puzzle and seeing if you're finding the same things. Um, it's important to kind of start to duplicate the natural environment being studied that can really help increase internal validity as well. As bad as the Stanford prison study by Zimbardo was in terms of ethics, um, that's what he was, he did a really good job of simulating that natural environment, okay, of simulating, in fact, too good of a job, that was the ethical problem with it, um, of simulating that guard versus prisoner kind of grouping, okay, he did a really good job of that. Um, and that was where the ethical violations kind of came in um, because harm was done in that situation. But that study has it had good external validity because that it was simulated. It really did have um, that manipulations were happening, um, even though these were, you know, Stanford College students. Um, they really did see, um, they did a pretty good job of, of duplicating that kind of prison environment, even though that they were in kind of the basement of the psych building. Um, so again, um, that's a, a situation where external validity was increased in, in a controlled experimental setting. Unfortunately, um, ethics were an issue there, but studies like this are what have helped shape our ethical code. Um, field experiments. Um, so doing these experiments in natural settings. So again, you found it in the laboratory. Well, can I find it in the home? Can I find it in the schools? Can I find it in whatever sit other situations I'm interested in? Partial replications are where you do most of the study the same, but you change one thing or you add one piece. Um, and you do something slightly different so that you're again saying, yes, I found the same thing as here, but I also found this too. And they both are pointing to A is causing B um, to support for this um, idea. Conceptual replications um, were the same concepts being studied. They're doing it in a different way, um, but they're studying the same concept and they're finding the same thing. Again, this is where that body of literature really comes together. Um, these partial replications and these conceptual replications to really say, no, really, A is causing B. Statistical validity um, is the difference statistically significant and how large is the effect? This is an image from your book. Um, and what we'll see here is these orange dots are, cl are clustered closer together, um, whereas these blue dots are clustered farther apart. Because we still have a two point difference um, in the orange dots and the blue dots between the two means, we have nine versus um, 11 on both of them. But because we have less variability in the orange dots, what you see is a higher effect size, right? So that Cohen's D is below there, a 0.5. So we've got a medium effect size there. Whereas with the blue dots, um, we've got more variability. Those dots are more spread out. Each dot's representing an individual score. They've got more variability here. And so we have a lower um, effect size of 0.24, a pretty small um, or weak effect size. So here's that table from your book, again, um, that we'll, we'll get to use more as, as time goes on. Um, remember that, and I just want to point this out now before we get to the statistical part while we're talking about statistical validity, is that there are different cutoffs for different measures of effect size. So this is kind of the comparison of Cohen's D to um, the measure of R and how those are different kinds of effect size proportions. So if you get 0.5 and it's an, with an R, um, then you're actually got a pretty large effect size compared that's only a medium effect size with D. So it really is important to kind of distinguish between those. Um, and when we get to the statistics part, um, you'll really see that. But again, that effect size is the magnitude of the treatment effect independent of the sample size, okay? So how big is this treatment? And I really like these images to kind of talk about that, okay? Um, because what we have here is the black distributions 
are the distributions of scores before the treatment. And the blue dotted lines are the distributions of scores after the treatment. They're both normal curves, um, but they're laid on top of each other, okay? And what we have here, what they're showing us um, is kind of the differences in effect size. When there's a really small effect size, those distributions lay really closely on top of each other, okay? When there's a larger effect size, like in the bottom image where we have D is equal to 1, those are much, much further apart. Okay, this is also showing the relationship of variability with that, right? Um, so we have a much lower um, standard deviation um, in the bottom one. We have a difference of 15 versus 100 above, okay? So again, that's factoring in as well. Um, so again, um, it really is multiple factors are going on here. Um, but effect size is kind of this magnitude regardless of the individual scores, okay? Um, so it really is kind of irreverent to that. It's saying this is the magnitude of the effect regardless of whether it was a 30-point effect or a 300-point effect. Um, it tells you the magnitude of that taking into account those differences of the mean and the standard deviation. So here's, our, again, our gold standard of validities that we need for experimental research, internal validity. Um, again, we have internal validity when we can say confidently, without alternative explanations, that the independent variable is what caused change between our groups on our dependent variable. And that's the only time that we can say that. Um, is when we have internal validity, that A caused B, the changes in B. And that's when we can make that causal inference. That's when we can make that causal claim. Because we've ruled out everything else that could be going on. Nothing else could be going on. Because we either controlled it by balancing it or holding it constant. Nothing else was allowed to co-vary except that independent variable and the dependent variable. So those are the only two things that we can see are going on here. Remember that covariance is a piece of making a causal claim. We have to have that covariation. Um, but the only two things we want to covary together are that cause and effect. Remember, we have to have temporal precedence as well. Um, did the independent variable precede the dependent variable? Did the chicken come before the egg? Um, kind of a situation, right? One has to precede the other. The cause has to precede the effect in temporal precedence. Um, so again, we've got those things accounted for here and we've ruled out anything else that could be possibly going on. And that's when we're able to make these really strong causal claims. So there's three fundamental questions that we have to ask to make sure we really have internal validity. Were there any design confounds? And again, this is where that, um, that control freak stuff really starts to come in, okay? You have to kind of piecemeal think about all these little pieces. And could any of those things, were they allowed to co-vary? with the independent variable or the dependent variable. Did we, did we allow anything else to be in the mix here? Um, we also need to decide if an independent group test was used or that between subjects group, did they control for selection effects using random assignment? Did we randomly assign the groups or did we match the groups so that we had, again, an equal chance of being in group A versus group B, being in the control group versus the, the experimental group, so that we really controlled for any of those subject effects? And if it's a within subjects design, did we control for those order effects by counterbalancing? Remember, we talked about both these kinds of random assignment and matching issues, um, both on our Goldfish Cracker Day um, and, um, again, in class when we talked about within and between um, and in, in last week's online. The same thing with the uh, order effects, okay? We talked about what they are. We talked about how to counterbalance them and different ways to come up with those orders. Um, so again, these are the things that we need to be asking to make sure that we've really controlled for our issues. And independence groups design, may, remember our major risk, our biggest threat to our internal validity is selection effects. And again, we're using random assignment to, to control that. In a within groups design, our biggest threat is order effects. Okay, and we're using counterbalancing to control that. So again, are those things happening? Um, and then overall, were there any other things that we allowed to vary? Were there any design confounds? Those design confounds, remember, are extraneous variables. These are those practical considerations um, that we have to think about that could create a confound. 
this is again that nitpicky kind of detail oriented piece of research. Um, the number of participants in each session, um, the different experiments, the different rooms where the experiment is conducted, the different experimenters, any of those things could be, be potential confounds. So remember, we either need to hold it constant and not let it vary, or if it's going to, if it's something that has to vary and we can't hold it constant, then we need to balance that. And that independent groups design, again, our major risk is selection effects, okay? And we need to control that by random assignment. If we're using intact groups, um, then we've got a threat, okay? Because we can't, we're not using random assignment. We haven't controlled for con uh, selection effects. And so that's going to be a big um, problem. Um, if extraneous variables are not controlled, if we've allowed design contracts, uh, confounds, that's going to be a problem. If selective subject loss occurs, remember that's when um, something about one group causes more people to drop out than the other group, and it alters that equal groups, those um, group, equal groups that we had to begin with, those representative um, equal groups that they're treated equally, they're selected equally, all of that changes. If some, if one group has a whole bunch of people drop out and the other group doesn't. Demand characteristics. Um, this is when the participants figure out your hypothesis um, or these experimenter effects, something that you have maybe one really nice experimenter and one really nice, not nice experimenter, and that's allowed to co-vary as well. So those are the things we have to worry about. Those demand characteristics include, um, so again, back to that the Stanford prison study, um, there's when one of the guys was interviewed, um, he said, oh, well, I thought the study was about this. Um, I thought it was really, he was a, assigned to be a guard, and he thought this study was kind of, this was happening in the, you know, the 70s, the early 70s, and he really thought this was kind of about the man um, um, putting, you know, pressure on, on the individual people, you know, this kind of system. And so he was going to be that angry man um, of the system, kind of oppressing other people. And he said that. He said, I thought this was what it was about. Um, and so I changed my behavior based on it. He tried to figure out what the hypothesis was. There was issues with demand characteristics. Um, we also remember when these intact groups are used, these are the groups that happened before the experiment. This could be children in different classrooms, departments within an organization, sections of a course. Um, when we have this, we don't have random assignment, which means we did not control for those selection effects. And remember, that's the major threat we have to internal validity and in independent groups designs. So when these are used, um, those subject characteristics are not balanced and we don't have equal groups. Because of that, we have an alternative explanation. We don't have internal validity. So for a true experiment, we really can't use intact groups. So that kind of wraps us up um, for the, the issues that we have in um, causality and validity. Um, we will um, see you in class next time.